Hello and welcome to the Overland Journal podcast. I'm your host, Scott Brady. And for today's guest, we actually have my co-host, Ashley Giordano, who is going to give us an update on Richard and her travels through Europe. They ship their Tundra and Pop Top Camper over to Europe. They shipped it over to England and they spent a bunch of time up in Scotland and they have been slowly moving their way down through Europe and they're currently in Spain. So we get a, a good update on the truck. We get a good update on the camper, the things that they're learning about working and traveling full time out of the vehicle. They actually have no end date to this trip. So they really are in fully embracing what could be a lifelong adventure of travel and work um, as a couple. And then we also go into some of their experiences traveling with X Overland when they just recently went to South Africa, Botswana, and Namibia. So a great conversation with Ashley. Of course, we dig deep into some books that she's been reading and some of the other adventures that she's been having on her travels through Europe. So please enjoy my conversation with Ashley Giordano. And a special thanks to Kuat Racks for their support of this week's podcast. Their new Ibex has landed. It's actually overlanded. This groundbreaking bed rack is effortlessly handling substantial loads both on and off the grid. Constructed from lightweight yet durable aluminum, it boasts a ballistic black powder coat made for all the nature you can throw at it. It's available in six different frame sizes to accommodate most truck models, and it's equipped with telescoping crossbars. Numerous T-channels and a versatile full and half height configuration right out of the box. This is the Ibex from Kuat. It is engineered for adventure. For more details, please visit kuat.com. Kuat, because you will absolutely love this bed rack. Ashley, thank you so much for taking the time today to be on the podcast. Whether you like it or not, I think this might be called the Amazing Ashley episode. So we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, it'll be fun to have the tables turned. I am now the <laughs> interviewee instead of the interviewer, which is fun. Well, not just me, but everyone else who listens to the podcast know, knows that you are the best Overland Journal podcast host. So I am just grateful to be the one that gets to do the interview. So <laughs> uh, I'm flattered, but wholeheartedly disagree. <laughs> <laughs> we will have to respectfully disagree. <laughs> All right. So how fun is this? So you are in Europe, I believe, still? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and I, in Spain. Awesome. And I am in Nairobi, Kenya. I actually fly out tomorrow. So we have both been traveling a lot over this last six, seven months. But I really wanted to focus in this episode about your travels, what Richard and you are experiencing catch in on how the Tundra is doing, how the camper is doing, how you're enjoying traveling in Europe. But let's start with when did you leave Canada? What When was that? So it was, I think, right after Christmas last year. So it's yeah, almost, so we are almost a, year. a year. Yeah. And <laughs> if I remember, you left Canada and you kind of needed to sprint down to Texas to ship the truck. Is that right? Yeah, we tried to sprint and then we uh, had a couple of hurdles to surmount, but then we eventually did get there. And did were you able to containerize the Tundra with Camper? So we didn't actually look into the container option uh, just because the roll-on, roll-off was uh, better in terms of financial uh, financial standpoint. Way cheaper. Yeah, and we felt okay. You know, it was going from Texas to Southampton in the UK. So we're like, eh, we've done roll on, roll off before. And we had a good contact with the agency. And so that's how we did it. I think roll on, roll off, especially from countries that are producing new vehicles, it tends to be really efficient. Uh, one of the times that I did that was from Panama back to Houston. And that was because um, we had so many roll-on, roll-off vehicles. A bunch of vehicles that were with us just didn't fit in containers. And it was fine. I mean, 
we left all of our personal effects in there and you basically you hand them the keys and everything was there on the other end it just wasn't an issue same so. a good experience and we could lock the camper up as well so it was a separate uh unit um so it didn't require they didn't require any for us to leave it open or anything they allowed like you to lock the camper even when it was on the truck yeah that's impressive that's impressive that they don't always allow that um yeah I was surprised for sure, but um, yeah, yeah, it really worked out well. And I think we get a little bit stressed out sometimes, but roll on, roll off, which I think in the past, or I mean, probably for the present, in the present right. as well, is for good reason. Um, but yeah, it was a really easy, very straightforward procedure, and we couldn't, it couldn't have gone any better than it did. So we were really happy. And when did it, when did it land in Southampton? This was in, I believe, May. April, April, <laughs> April. Okay, April. That's so. Oh, that is. So, it's so funny because I we haven't really chatted about this, but so your truck would have come in to Sam Southampton in April, and the Grenadier left Southampton in May. <laughs> so you're just like, <laughs> like crossing in the night. <laughs> yeah, totally. Oh, that's so cool. And then it looked like you spent a lot of time in the northern part of the UK. What did you think of that? Yeah, we spent a ton of time in Scotland. Um, we just slowed. I've right never been. Ah, yeah. Oh, it's so beautiful. So beautiful. We would just find a spot that we liked. And I think we were, we were kind of fed through England quickly uh, to try to beat the midges, the little tiny gnat bugs that are yeah. now in uh, Scotland. And um, that was part of the reason why we kind of headed up there quickly. And then we would just find a good spot that we liked and just stay there for a long time. And I think we were also trying to um, figure out the balance that our new life would entail, you know, trying to keep all of these things in line. And it takes time to plan where you're going to go next, what you're going to do next, where you're going to camp, and then also have the work side as well and then getting to know the vehicle and there were all these things happening so i think it for us it was a good idea to slow down a little bit and yeah we did tons of hiking and uh what else did we do i don't know like camped on white sand beaches and in scotland which i didn't know existed so yeah now Great. were you able to remote camp for some of it or was most of it in like established campgrounds uh both so on the Outer Hebrides, we wild, I guess wild, sort of wildish camped out there with no facilities. Um, but most places, there's usually one, at least one other vehicle there with you. Um, so not always, but it was rare that we were by ourselves, which I think is a theme. Yeah, in Europe. yeah that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's just a lot of a lot of people. So somewhat selfishly, because you have seemed to somehow manage this balance with accomplishing tasks at work, Ooh. would you have any, I know, it's so tough, it's so tough. Would you have any advice for those that are listening that are trying to work while traveling? Uh, because it is probably the hardest thing that I do in my life, is somehow get the work done that I need to get done while I'm on the road. and if you have any advice i'd love to hear it too so yeah i think it depends on what the trip is like as well i think your trip is a little probably faster paced than ours because i'm finding that slowing down is the key to really um getting my stuff done on time um, yeah. so just spending an extra day somewhere or two days and just making sure that you know certain days are dedicated to work and also realizing that we are here because of the work and so that we have to have a good balance between the two obviously work takes a sure. lot of time but then also we find that sometimes work is like a steady drip you know you're working a little bit seven days a week you're not necessarily monday to friday i'm sure you're familiar with that as well um yeah but yeah in terms of advice i guess it depends what your job is but um slowing down a lot and also like the Starlink has been such a game changer for us and it's taken a huge amount of stress off even for the price. Cause I think it can be 
uh, a bit expensive, but I think the amount of stress that it's taken off and its reliability has been such a game changer for us here. It's it's just so incredible. Now, are you you guys are on a Canadian plan? Is that right? So is it about two hundred dollars a month? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, because it's the one that I'm on is it's two hundred dollars a month for the mobile global plan, um, and it's it's shocking how well the Starlink works, even in motion. So it just provides a an, an kind of another level of of security, comfort, um, connectivity. On this last segment, I was able to travel with my girlfriend, Tavia, and she runs a group home for medically fragile children. So she kind of needs to be connected. She can be on a trip, but she needs to be able to provide, you know, fairly quick response if there's an emergency happening with one of the kids. And just be, being able to do that allowed her to come along. So it just it can be a game changer, I think, for people. For sure. I've actually been quite surprised that we haven't seen more Canadians out here or more Americans out here. And I think the tendency is to head south uh, into Mexico yeah. and Central. You know, that's easier because you could just start driving. Um, but yeah, a lot of people work online now and it's getting easier and easier. So um, yeah, it's pretty incredible. It's incredible that we can do this right now and I'm on Starlink. <laughs> yeah. Know? In Spain, and then the so you're you're inside your now the the camper. I get it. There's so many different combinations of X's and overlands and overlands and X's. You're in an overland X camper, is that right? Overland Explorer vehicles, Alpine, flat Alpine. Yeah. Okay, yeah, got it. So how do you configure that when you are both trying to work? Is there enough room at the dinette? There is, yeah. Fortunately, the dinette has a lot of space, and the way that we've configured it, uh, we've made sure we've actually put the fridge where the shower or the toilet would go. So we just decided not to have a toilet there or the shower, and so the fridge is tucked away, and so we have quite a bit of roomy space at the dinette so we can both work, which is great. I got it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to. It has to be your kind of mobile studio. And are you in the camper now? It's kind of hard to tell. Yeah. <laughs> that's so cool. That's so cool. Yeah, that's so cool. I'm in my I'm in my last day in the, I mean, it's amazing also in Airbnb how inexpensive it can be in places of the world. I mean, I'm in this Airbnb for eleven days total because of I'm doing a bunch of different projects here in Nairobi and it was I think three hundred and eighty dollars or something like that. So it's just incredible. It's incredible. incredible. And I think Dude, those incredible. Airbnbs are so helpful because sometimes you just need a break from the road. You know, like there's yeah. so many tasks to keep track of all the time. You're always thinking yeah. about the vehicle and you need to get groceries sometimes and do laundry and find somewhere to camp. And where are you going to go next? What are we going to do in Valencia? Oh, we need yeah. to find water. Oh, we need to, you know, the list, the daily tasks is like endless. So once in a while, it's nice to just be in an Airbnb and take a bit of a look. Yeah, I agree. And I try to do that two nights out of each travel week because then that does give me a full day to really focus on work. I always have this vision that I'm going to get like eight to 10 hours in, but it's very difficult because you're trying to do exactly what you're talking about. You're trying to get your laundry done. You're trying to do, you know, inspections on the vehicle. Fortunately, I haven't had any repairs, but you know, I'm constantly checking on the vehicle to make sure that I'm not having is any issues, you know, or just tightening rack bolts or whatever. It just takes time. And so yeah. then you're lucky if you end up with six or seven hours on that day. Yeah, absolutely. And then I find work tasks take a long time or they don't take a lot. Well, they take a while, but they take longer than I think they're going to take as well. So. Totally for me. I'm I'm eternally optimistic. So I I think I uh, estimate that things will be done in about half the time that they actually take. So <laughs> uh, the life of a creative. So <laughs> so overall, what's working really well 
in the camper? Like, what are the things that you guys really love about the camper? And are there any things that you feel like you might want to change before you head to more remote locations or something that you would have spec'd differently on the camper? Okay. Yeah. So I thought that I was going to have more things to be nitpicky about with this camper, not because of anything specifically, like the company has a really good reputation and the build quality is excellent. Um, but I thought little little nit- nitpicky things that you yourself would pick out, you know what I mean? Um, sure. But it's been fabulous. Like the dinette layout we love, the kitchen I love, the storage, like there's too much storage for us. It's not, it's, I feel like we have to try not to fill it up. And I bring a lot of books home with me when we go home for Christmas because they're heavy. And (laughs) yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, So storage is fantastic. The bed is luxurious. Um, I would say the space is really great for two people. Um, Maybe a little, I mean, when there are two people in a camper, you're always going to be bumping into each other, I think. But yeah. um, overall, we're, we do pretty well. So, yeah. Um, and people tend to find their little corners. Like, I, yeah. I kind of find my little corner of, like, when I was in the scout, I would find, like, my little corner. And then, you know, people can be moving around in other other locations or whatever. So, it does, you do find your little spot. Exactly. Um, we made a few changes going in. Like I mentioned, uh, we opted out for the toilet edition, which we can talk a bit about later uh, because we. Yeah, that's did. In, that's interesting. <laughs> it's interesting to do. Yeah. Uh, because it's actually one of the the shower and a toilet is one of the reasons I would even have a camper. <laughs> it's funny how everybody has different needs. So. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll tell you a little bit more about that after because i think camping in europe uh it's really helpful to have a toilet inside but yeah no toilet no shower also that's weight savings not having the big sure. big toilet uh we also put in an induction cooktop uh which i also really love a lot you know you're not working worrying about uh ventilation um or yeah. sourcing propane right we do have a heater. The, do you have the right adapters or whatever? Yeah. Exactly. So we have a heater that runs on propane. So we do have to look into adapters, but it's not, it hardly <clears throat> ever happens because we're not, it's just sipping fuel. We're not using the heater that often yet. So that's yeah, the, sure. Um, and yeah, you're then, moving south with the winter. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so some things that I would maybe change. Uh, the window mesh, uh, the holes are really large, I would say. So we have bugs coming in through there, which isn't my favorite. Got it. I think that's one of the weakest points of the camper, actually. Uh, it should be more like kind of a really fine, tight mesh. I'm sure there's a reason why they didn't, because the mesh that is here is like bomber. It's You can tell it's really strong, but the holes are just too big. Um, so it favors airflow over because it probably doesn't keep out no seams and really no. small gnats and stuff. Nope. Um, but we'll see how much of an issue that will be going south. I'm not sure. Uh, but we have had Pro- like, probably issues. probably not. Um, yeah. Because even even the mosquitoes in Africa are going to be too big to I would think. Yeah. For sure. And then we just get out our vacuum cleaner, which is my number one uh, choice of my favorite piece of overland gear is our vacuum. So I just vacuum them up. It's not a huge deal. (laughs) Uh, While they're flying around the light, you just. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) Uh, Okay. Fields all, you know, they're like. Uh, And the other thing is, so in Europe, we're finding. I feel like this wasn't such a thing in North America with gray water. You would just kind of wash your dishes and you'd be somewhere remote. And people don't necessarily bring their gray water out with them unless they're in an RV. Um, but here it's like self-containment is key and you don't, there's so many people traveling through that you don't want to dump your gray water. And so we've been piping ours from the gray water little exit, which is quite high. 
on the camper. Um, so the gray water, if it's open, it's like dripping down the side of the camper. So it would be right. nice to have a gray water hole that's actually further down, maybe underneath. So it's not doing that. So <laughs> bless you. Thank you. <laughs> it's the same thing on the scout because the scout has, I mean, it has no plumbing other than a single drain hose that goes from the sink to an outside faucet. So then I have a, a, a short section of hose that I can run down and into a five gallon bucket if I'm in a place where it's not appropriate to do that. So, yes. so we've been doing that as well. And it's great because our hose is bright blue and it looks super uh, attractive. No. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you have to get the angle just right to get the hose out of there. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, those are very small things. Uh, I don't foresee any changes needing to be made going further south. Uh, we put up like a little towel rack for a Ikea and we'll have nice. to get something that uh, covers the back door because it is, you can't see into the camper. Um, but right. those are small things. And then the lifting mechanism on the, for the roof, is that have some struts that help lift that? Or is it kind of a two person job? Oh, it's a one person job. Yeah, for sure. Nice. Like, I can do it easily myself, which Some is great. Some of them can be very heavy. Yep. Yeah, I'm getting uh, my shoulder workout for sure. <laughs> it's oh, easy. That's great. Yeah, easy for me, which is helpful. Well, let's shift a little bit to the Tundra because I, I just thought your, your choice of the Tundra was so cool because it was a vehicle that you had. You didn't go out and spend a bunch of money. That 5.7, even though it's not efficient at all, it's very reliable. Um, so how is the Tundra doing? And, and what do you like that you modified on it? And what do you think was maybe not necessary? Hmm, good question. So, so initially, we did have quite serious reservations about the Tundra. I may have mentioned this before, just because of its size, mainly. Yeah. Um, we have these visions of these tiny little roads in Europe, and we thought it was too wide. Uh, but then we talked with Dan at Molly Mish, and he was like, well, Sprinter vans are the same width, and they can go everywhere that beer is being delivered eventually. That's true. So, yeah, uh, it'll just keep you out of some of the small, you know, really old villages is all. But you can't really go in there with most overland vehicles anyways. No, and we're finding that because... <laughs> Caravan culture is so prevalent here that there's always somewhere to park that's kind of on the outskirts of town or at a supermarket, and we've had no problems finding somewhere to park. Just there are so many RVs here and so many caravans that are bigger than us, and so that hasn't really been an issue uh, yet. Maybe sometimes the height restriction in some parking lots, but it's really not been a problem at all. Uh, so yeah, I think that's the one thing that people were concerned for us was size, especially southern England, but we found it to be fine. Um, about, what about uh, when you park it and you want to go into the town, you guys just tend to hoof it or you have a bike that you have with you or what's the, or you use little Uber trips or what, how do you normally handle that? Yeah, it depends on what the location is, but we've either walked or mostly walked because usually there's some sort of parking whether it's just day parking or overnight parking available and then yeah sometimes an uber sometimes a city bus uh we're going to be going into valencia tomorrow and take the subway i believe or the train cool yeah cool. so it just depends on the location um but we don't have a bike or any form of motor transport or scooter or anything but yeah but overall the truck has been really really great here very reliable. Um, obviously, fuel consumption is not the best, um, <laughs> but we go slow, and the distances are short. And so, you know, sure. driving across Texas was a haul, and uh, that's very different than being over here and we drive for an hour or less, and we find something completely new, or we go into another country. So, yeah, totally. Now, this trip is so different from what you guys did driving all the way down to Ushuaia. 
how are you finding that you're enjoying or or what do you think is the major contrast with going from at times developing countries you know a a trip down the americas is very different than a trip down europe like you've done oh my gosh yeah we were talking about recently how this always comes up it's like can america versus europe and it's so 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 different and um i would say obviously our vehicle choice is very different we're a lot more comfortable um but we made that decision based on longevity uh because we wanted to be able to be doing this for uh a long time so long-term sustainability in terms of being out here here for a while uh so that's one thing uh but when we were on the pan american highway it was like we have this amount of money and we don't have that much time ish um so it was always kind of moving 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 quickly ish uh so that's one thing and then i feel like pretty it's pretty easy here uh so here i mean england scotland wales uh spain so far those are the countries did you take a fair did you take the ferry or did you take the tunnel we ferried over got it yeah yeah because it was going to be the same amount essentially and then it just took some wear and tear off the vehicle and uh yeah gave some time and energy um and we're like we want to head south asap we need that sunshine so <laughs> Yeah, Pan American, obviously a budget difference. Uh, I think most countries are less expensive to travel through than in Europe, although we're finding it's not as expensive as over here as we thought it was going to be. Spain and Portugal, it's much less expensive. Yeah, and I think different things are expensive, like certain campgrounds here are very expensive, so we just avoid those. But then a bottle of wine is like $3, so... um, it's interesting like those staples those staples of eggs wine bread a cappuccino it's all a fraction of what it costs in the u.s absolutely yeah in england like the uk was quite expensive to go for coffee yes um groceries were so groceries were maybe slightly less expensive than the u.s and canada i would say there um so yeah that was very interesting um the other thing i've noticed over here is you're really traveling amongst europeans in caravans and so you know we stick out where it's very obvious that we're not from here it's very (laughs) this vehicle we drive people are like what is happening because they don't see they don't see something that it looks like this over here it's all white camper vans essentially right in spain anyways so yeah but we could have a whole podcast episode on the differences you know (laughs) no and maybe maybe we'll do that at some point in time but i i do really find that there's so much history Mm. in europe there's so much to learn and i also find that the people are so thoughtful and insightful that i just really enjoy the social nature of traveling in europe yeah I really, I really like that um, because you're really just not finding that much off road. You guys will certainly in Spain and Andorra and Portugal, but other than that, there's not a lot. So no, it, we did get a bit of a taste of it uh, in the northern section of Spain, and I think that's one thing to come prepared to Europe with the mindset that you're not that necessarily going to be there to off road. That's not necessarily the whole point of things although i've heard you know there are certain routes through spain and portugal of course um but we're also here during winter and so those aren't things that we're going to be doing just because like it's not possible for us or we don't aren't interested in doing trying to do an off-road route in the snow with our home on wheels um <laughs> yeah sure so just yeah, go- the pyrenees will be dumping with snow now so yeah, yeah. We already had snow, I think it was a couple of weeks ago up there, and um, we were like, no thanks. So, yeah. <laughs> Just like your mobile goes head south. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, we left Canada for a reason. We did. Yeah, we did. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so funny. So um, let's talk a little bit. During your trip, you left and went 
to Africa. And I actually got to see Richard and you briefly in South Africa with Clay and the rest of the team. Yeah. Um, so how, how was, how was, um, you, you, you did a little bit of stuff in Iceland and then you did some stuff in Africa. And so you've, you've also experienced some other adventures while you're on this trip. How is that working to like travel while you're traveling? <laughs> yeah. So last year uh, was the Nordic series. That was last summer, not this previous one. So that was like more than a year ago, which was great. So we weren't traveling while we were traveling for that one, but for uh, Southern Got it. Africa was this past summer uh, and it was yep. really nice. It was a nice, um, it was like a break from Scotland, which I think we needed because, you know, you get very comfortable and we knew what to expect in Scotland. We felt very safe there. Everybody's very friendly. We knew where to get things. Um, so it was almost like a temporary home. And so we were like, let's mix things up, you know? So with the, the um, Africa trip with Expedition Overland happened uh, in South, that was South Africa, Namibia, Botswana, we were ready for a bit of a, an exciting adventure, which it definitely was. Um, so just switching up everything in terms of understanding the culture a little bit more and the basics of where to get water and food and all that stuff changed. So it was an amazing education uh, that I don't think we would have had for a long time in that part of the world. So, yeah, that was that was cool. And probably stretched your guys is. Um creative muscles a little bit and driving and you know because you know there's it's a bigger operation and there's these are typically remote challenging routes so it's a good refresher on that kind of driving yeah it was really nice to um be off road so much um that was really really exciting and set you know really long punishing <laughs> roads uh, and lots of corrugation, which was, I love, I loved it. I thought it was a really fun break, but in terms of the machine of expedition overland while we were there, uh, Richard was doing photography and videography. So he was doing most, most filming. And then, um, I was in responsible for navigation and route planning and I guess activity planning and cooking along with Rochelle. So I had a, a wide, wide range of responsibilities. So I was quite busy throughout the trip, but just moving a group of eight throughout that Southern section of Africa for 60 days um, was definitely challenging. <laughs> That's for sure. Yeah. And it, it's, you know, I think back on like, things that we did with Expedition 7, and it was that way. It was just really, you were constantly learning and growing and improving. You weren't really, you didn't have as much time to sit and be in a place or in a space. It was definitely more of like a practitioner's challenge, which I, in hindsight, I, I'm glad, so glad that I was able to do, but it allows me like now where I mean, I I don't know how many months I've been in Africa, four months almost so far, just this second half of the year. And it'll I've been able to, by my pace, I have been able to slow down to a fraction of the pace that I've traveled before. So, yeah, there are different trips with different goals. And for us, these expedition overland trips are the purpose of it is to work. It's a it's a job for us. It's fun. You know, and it's with friends. Amazing people. And I mean, Clay and Ra Clay and Rochelle are such quality human beings that just getting a chance to go through those challenges with them is joyful. So, absolutely. I think the other thing that's really fascinating is that there's so much going on on those trips in terms of the learning and experiencing and your processing, but it's like the pace is fast and so you're trying to process what's happening and what you're learning while you're doing it which is almost like impossible so you're kind of like why am i feeling the way that i'm feeling but you don't <laughs> have enough time or you don't have enough insight yet to be able to a answer those questions or how can i make this more efficient but it's it's like 
tricky because you don't necessarily know the answer until you get home. And there's no way of really getting it at that time because you're just so like in it. So yeah, it's fun. Got a lot of a lot of objectives, but I can't wait to see the content that Clay and the team puts out. Just going to be awesome. So me too. It'll be so fun to see to see where they traveled and you traveled. Incredible stuff. Incredible stuff. Oh, that's so that's so good. And then, so anything that you had that was kind of a unique takeaway from that experience in Africa? Did it get you excited about traveling in in Africa or? Oh, yeah, um, for sure. Yeah, I was like, we should come back. I would love to come back. And and I hadn't been to Africa before. That was my first time. Uh, and so, yeah, it was it was great. Um, I think the other thing that I learned, too, was. Like working how I'm not really sure how to explain this, but like how to be your best self while working in a team. Mm. And how you react to challenges that are thrown your way in a team and all the dynamics between all the team members and and all of that. And I think I it was I don't know if all the lessons have come together quite yet, but I know some of them have. Um, so I'll take that forward into future trips. And, you know, you learn a lot about yourself and and when you're in an, a leadership role, um, I have really a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot to learn and improve upon uh, in that department. So. Um, yeah, it'll be fun to see how that progresses. Yeah. You and you and me both. It's a constant learning process and it's humbling to be around people that you genuinely care about and you're trying to make it work and everybody's doing their best. And that's pretty humbling to see everybody work so hard to have a positive outcome. So, yeah. Yeah. And a special thanks to O3 Outdoors for their support of this week's podcast. The world is messy. That's the price every outdoorsman pays for adventure. So when we need to keep things fresh, well, we at O3 Outdoors don't just do things halfway. We turn to the same technology NASA uses to clean the space station, and we bring it down to our own frontier. You know the smells, the sweat, smoke, and fuel, the smells of a proper adventure. The stuff of a true outdoorsman knows firsthand. Our technology here at O3 Outdoors eliminates bacteria and odors on gear or in your homes and on your vehicles. Our Trekker bags allow you to pack, store, and carry your gear, cleaning it the entire time. Our portable Overlander units fit in any vehicle, home, or RV. It's the highest tech brought to you to the outdoor experience, keeping your gear fresh, from one frontier to another. For more information, visit o-3outdoors.com. O3 Outdoors, go explore. So you are in Spain. Let's talk about what's next. So, or for what you'd like to talk about what's next. I don't know if, you've even, if you even know what's next, but you're currently in Spain. Uh, and where are you planning to go next? So we'll be here for a few more weeks and then we are heading home to Canada. Oh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, for Christmas. So we'll probably be home about a month and then yeah. we'll come back. Same with me. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, oh, it's going to be cold and the jet lag and I'm all <laughs> but it's sunny here, but it'll be really <laughs> lovely, you know, visiting with family and seeing friends and, and doing North American things again, I guess. I don't know. Um, <laughs> But after we fly back to Madrid, we will run out our time, our Schengen time here. So we get 90 out of 180 days in the Schengen zone, like in Europe. Um, yep. And then we will be heading into Morocco next. That's perfect. You're going to love it there. And it's your vehicle will be very well suited to that condition. Excellent. For sure. You got, yeah, you guys will really enjoy it. And there's just so many not only things to see, but there's just a lot of variety to Morocco that's surprising. Um, so it, there will be a lot to do there. And are you thinking about going into the Western Sahara or a little further south or just kind of Morocco at the time? I'd really like to head further south. I don't know how far yet. So I think that'll yeah. be my, my goal over Christmas time is to look into that a bit more and see see how we want to do it. I don't think we'll 
we won't go all the way down. I just don't think that the timing's right. And um, I honestly don't, I wouldn't want to do it in this vehicle. Yeah. I, I'm very capable. Um, that's not really an issue, but I just don't think it's the right vehicle for that trip. I mean, it, it can certainly yeah. be done. It can certainly be done, but, you know, it, it, Western Africa is a lot more challenging on the vehicle. It's just kilometer after kilometer of abuse, pretty much unrelenting from when you go into the Western Sahara until you get into, out, you know, into uh, basically Namibia. So, yeah. Yeah, we'll see. You know, it's pretty, pretty unrelenting. So. I think too that's and a things much. are changing. Things are changing right. so much. So you may it it's possible that that Sudan will open up and then you guys can come down through Egypt and and do the eastern route, which would be very suitable to your truck. So I would love that. I would love if that was possible. Um but yeah, we'll see how things progress and what the research says and I don't know. Yeah, no, take it one step at a time. I'm, I'm happy to do the same. So I'm, I'm heading back tomorrow and I'm going to be spending, you know, the next two months planning A, B, and C, um, to get further north. At a minimum, uh, Ethiopia and Djibouti is going to be no problem at the moment. I've got that figured out, but, um, I'd love to be able to continue north through Sudan and there's some possibilities around that. We'll see how they develop over the next 30 days or so. It's a lot Good. changing in the world, a lot of dynamics at the moment. 100%. I think, too, it depends on what the goals of the trip ultimately are. You know, I think we're going at a slow pace and we're enjoying and we're not, uh, we're not like we want to do this expedition from point A to point B. Um, and if we were, that would just be a yeah. mind change that we would make and choose different uh, routes. So, yeah. See? Well, this week, your, in fact, this podcast with you will go live on Thursday, Thanksgiving Day in the United States. And what is it, October 9th? Is that Thanksgiving in Canada? Yeah, around there. I think so. Do you guys really celebrate Thanksgiving in a way? We do. Yeah. I mean, we haven't been home for Thanksgiving uh, in many years because I think we were uh, part of the Rebel Rally team and it always is right on the thanksgiving weekend um but yeah, yeah. We, it's similar similar to the u.s for sure Turkey. i do find it i find it slightly humorous that it's that much earlier but it makes sense because summer is over in canada by what is it 27th of june so <laughs> <laughs> that's what it starts uh, that's what it starts <laughs> the one day you get the 28th of June for summer. <laughs> That's usually like the last snowfall in the Rockies. <laughs> uh, but I thought it was so interesting when I looked it up because, you know, this, there is so much for us to be grateful for. But I was like, when is Thanksgiving in Canada? And it was just so humorous that it was almost two months earlier than in the U.S., which makes sense because, you know, fall comes at a different time up there. So. And you spread your turkey out a little bit. So by the time you get to Christmas, <laughs> you know, turkey again. That's a, good, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. So being Thanksgiving week, are there any things that you're finding that you're particularly grateful in your life right now? For? Oh, yeah. Like pretty much everything. It's great. I think Richard and I had this dream or idea that we could be self-sufficient and um we could do this full time for a long time period. And then uh, we just had some roadblocks along the way, which is life. And we've gotten to the point now where we're able to do this full time and there's not really an end in sight, which is, I'm very grateful for that. Just being able to, when people ask, they say, well, when are your, when's your trip done? And we say, well, we don't really know. And I think that really blows people's minds. So that's a huge, 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 huge privilege and something that we worked hard for, but also it's part of that is definitely luck of the draw. So yeah. Extremely well, it, it's also 
you know, Richard and you are both really exceptional individuals in this industry. You're, you've both worked very hard to be great at your jobs and to develop meaningful relationships with companies and individuals and, and media outlets within the industry. So because you've worked so hard and you've focused so much on the quality of your craft that you now have the ability to work from anywhere. Um, so it's certainly a testament to Richard and you. Oh, thank you. I appreciate the compliment. But yeah, I think <laughs> it's proving that the concept works, which we know that it does, but physically being here really proves that, I guess. So yeah, so very grateful for that. Very grateful. I bet. The delicious cortados in Spain and the sunshine <laughs> and the olive groves and all of those things. So yeah. Great food in Spain too. Mm-hmm. Yep. I mean, great food throughout Europe, but UK not so much, but the rest of Europe. Although UK gets better. London always has great food. I just, yeah, when you I get mean, a little bit, when you get a little bit out of the city, it gets a little more challenging. <laughs> they do coffee well, I will say. Yeah, that's true. But, yeah. That's true. Yeah. Which is important. I think I could live on that. <laughs> so we've talked about what you got coming next and, of course, focusing a little bit on the gratitude of it being Thanksgiving when this episode drops. But because you and I are a bit of bookophiles, I wanted to follow up on the many dozens of books that you have read since we last chatted. Uh, but are there some that come to mind? Some favorites? There are. Uh, so I read Cry of the Kalahari, which everybody freaks out about that one. And we're like, you have to read this. And it was it was a really good book. Like it was very action packed and fascinating. So that's, uh, I believe, two American biologists moved to the middle of the Kalahari, like literally in the middle of nowhere in the, the 70s or wow. something to study um, wildlife there to get a I. It must have been to get grants. Like, I think they were working on researching so they could get grants to continue the research. Um, but they're in the middle of the Kalahari where there is nothing. And they had, wow. like, drums of water they got from Maun and Botswana. And it was incredible to read, uh, especially after being in that area. And all yeah. of the challenges that they had to overcome to study all the animals and what the relationship was with them as, uh, scientists studying the behavior of the animals. But then while they're there, obviously their presence impacts the animals, but even though they want to make it as little as possible. So that one's really interesting. I would highly recommend that. But Good the suggestion. one thing that was kind of crazy that came out of that book uh, is the author, co-author Delia Owen wrote Where the Crawdads Sing, I believe, and I had no clue it was the same author. So that was Crazy. That's impressive. That That's impressive mind. to have that that scope of talent as a as a writer. Right. Uh, so that one was really good. And also, I just read In Search of Sheba by Barbara Toy, which links back to me trying to figure out a how to collect all of her eight books that are out of print. And B, kind of like stalk her and uh, her history throughout England. Um, so that book is back in print. And Lois Price has written the intro, which is very special and exciting. Uh, so that's nice that you don't have to pay, you know, several hundred dollars to be able to read Bar a Barbara Toy book now, which was the case yeah. a few months ago. Um, so in England, I did you find? Did you find any any? crazy little book finds when you were looking in bookstores in England? So I found, uh, was it three? No, I found three of Barbara Toy's books, two originals, so with photos. Those are very hard to find. And then one of them was like a different edition. So it was like a reprint back in the day without photos. But those, I mean, they're very expensive. And one of them I found in the town that she lived until just before she passed away so i went and checked out her, the place she lived and went to this this uh this restaurant she used to go to with journalists like she used to go there all the time and Amazing. i found 
one of the books in that town her her like town where she it was ridiculous and then i went and drove her land rover pollyanna <laughs> amazing land rover oh, still running and the lovely man that owns the the land rover now he's been taking care of it for a long time and his dad was given it uh years and years ago because he was the mechanic barber toys mechanic um anyway so yeah that was cool first of all driving a series one land rover that was the first time i had ever driven one and <laughs> specifically that's a party to some epic, epic adventure lady that <laughs> drove all over the world in it so that was very special but i was gonna say that the in search of shiva um she goes to ethiopia in that book in search of the queen of shiva and some history about her and so that one will be a review. I reviewed it. It'll be upcoming in one of the Overland Journal issues, so people can read more about it. Yeah, I should read that because Ethiopia is coming very soon for me. So, yeah, and she crosses the Sahara to get there, and it's right. Yeah, very cool. And there's a very James Bond esque scene at the end that might be interesting <laughs> for you to read. Also, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so. You and I both ask this question from a lot of our guests, but now that you have kind of had some of these new experiences, both with X Overland and traveling without an end date, what would be, would you revise any of your pieces of advice for someone who's getting new into overlanding and wants to have this kind of an experience? What would be your, your top two or three pieces of advice that you would give to a new traveler like if you could talk to yourself at you know six years ago and give yourself some advice Oof. so the first time we left it was very easy to leave we were just like peace we're out you know just got everything together didn't know anything and just left which there's beauty in that like a great beauty in that and then the second time this past year was a lot harder and I had a lot more, I had more concerns this time. I think being a little bit older, maybe you're kind of like, Ooh, and the creature comfort starts sneaking in. And I was like, can we really do this? Even though we had done it before in a very, in much more challenging way. And so I think maybe over time it can get more and more challenging if you've been out of it for a little while to jump into it. And so I really understand the things that people have to overcome to be able to get on the road because it's not easy. But if you stick with it, if this is what you want to do and it's your goal and your dream, I think that you kind of just have to work through that fear and hesitation um, and get to the other side because it's so, so, so worth it. Um, but I get it. You're like, where am I going to go to the bathroom? Where am I going to shower? You know, I'm so comfortable in my life right now. Um, but yeah. discomfort is good for you. We're meant to have it. I mean, if you look at the history of humanity, it's been only very recently that we even had the option for a toilet in our camper. <laughs> so, um, yeah, most of human history was a lot of challenge and a lot of adversity. And we're well, we're well tuned to it. I think that we... We're meant to do that. We're meant to have challenge in our life. So, yeah. And don't feel the need to be pressured into doing YouTube. I think that's another one that people feel yeah. like, oh, they're going to do this trip. Well, we should probably do YouTube. Or people are like, are you on YouTube? Are you documenting on YouTube? And I think there are a lot of different ways to share a trip if you want to share it. And I think there's a lot of power in not sharing anything <laughs> also, mm -hmm. if you don't want to. Yeah. So. And I think, yeah, people feeling comfortable making whatever decisions best for them and their travel companions or just themselves if they're travel traveling solo for sure i do find that for me putting a, a kind of a big goal out there is usually what i need because then like and especially if you make it public or you tell people that you care about and respect in your life this is what i'm going to do for me that's usually what keeps the ball moving in that direction I find for myself is just getting or setting a date or or buying air tickets 
even if it's six months out or just something like that can often be really, really, um, it'll drive you forward. Absolutely. I know I was getting really sick of talking about this trip because I feel like we were ready to go before COVID. And I was like, we're going to do this trip. We're going to do this trip. And then I was like, so sick of hearing myself being like, we're going to do it. It's like, oh, well, I want to <laughs> be doing it now. <laughs> you know? Yeah, but sure. Yeah, it's nice to be able to say when you're doing it. Well, amazing, Ashley. Is there is there anything else going, like speaking of YouTube and all of the things, where is it best for people to continue to follow kind of on through social media in a more active way, follow Richard and your trip? How is they, how can they best follow you? Yeah. So I would say on Instagram at desk to glory underscore Ash and also at desk to glory. Um, I would also say on expedition portal, I'm trying to weave articles in that are helpful for people um, that have something to do with the locations that we've been in. So expeditionportal.com, of course, Overland Journal. And we will be having a series come out uh, on the Overlander or X Overland Network in January. Um, so Richard's been working really hard to do videos, 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 and that'll give people a little bit more of an idea of what we're doing. Um, but the Africa series will be coming out as well um, on that network too. Uh, in this see that that's going to be so so exciting. Well, and Ashley, thank you so much for all of your hard work on the podcast. You are an amazing host, and I'm so grateful that we get to share this platform together to speak to so many inspiring travelers. And thank you for being an inspiration yourself and for Richard for being such an inspiration. Um, it really adds a lot to this podcast because I'm sure people get tired of hearing me talk. So I'm just so grateful grateful that um that you've done such an amazing job with all of your guests so thanks for the opportunity it's yeah sharing people's story from the road is one of my favorite things and we can learn a lot from from all those travelers so yeah it's it's my my honor to be able to speak on the podcast to all sorts of amazing folks from all over the world so thanks yeah it's such a fun such a fun thing to do well thank you ashley enjoy your time in spain um, it's, well, it's still early enough in the day for you for another Cortado. So go for it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for having me on, Scott. And thank you, travel. Ashley. Thank, Abby, thank, thank you so you. much. Yes, thank you. And have a great time in Canada.